and welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and it's Mental Health Awareness Week, so I'm going to start off by saying, think of your mental health. Those who know me and have worked with me will know that that's a phrase I say a lot. I will admit, sometimes flippantly, to justify not doing something you don't want to do. I had a colleague say to me a few months ago, you know, I need a recording of you saying that to remind myself. Well, here it is. Think of your mental health. In the days before COVID, I'd use that phrase a lot in regards to the everyday pressures that would face as freelancers and musicians. Some examples being taking on work you dread because the payoff is appealing financially, taking on too much work, not having enough work, not having enough time to focus on yourself. The list could go on. Now we're all forced to stop and really reflect what it is that makes us happy. A lot of people listening to this will say, well, that's making and listening to music, but the way we used to do that has vanished for the foreseeable future. So we've got to try and find those things that benefit ourselves mentally, but be honest in the process. The things that are good for your mental health can change with time or how you happen to be feeling that day. And it's easy to feel bad or guilty, further compounding those problems within, but sometimes you have to acknowledge it, be honest, and either go with it or speak out about it. I'll go first. I absolutely love this podcast. It brings me such joy in so many ways. It challenges me, motivates me, and I learn so much from what my guests tell me. But these are also the same things that get me down sometimes. Occasionally, I don't want the challenge. I don't want to be motivated. I don't want to listen to my guests sometimes. <gasps> that doesn't happen very often. Sometimes I just want to lie motionless on the floor with a cold drink and daydream. I daydream a lot, sometimes when I'm working or in rehearsal. So all those people who think I have that look of intense concentration, quite often I'm just thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner later that night. Sometimes I just want to stare at my potato plants for half an hour. Their foliage is shooting up at an alarming rate. I will admit that's what I was doing before writing these thoughts down. Potatoes. But I think that's okay. I must remember not to put too much pressure on myself, because then it wouldn't be fun anymore. And everything should have an element of fun in it, right? I do realise that my problems may sound trivial to some, and I will acknowledge my privilege. I mean, here I am moaning about my vegetable gardens and my lovely garden flat. I don't have any immediate health or financial problems at the moment. I have a loving and hilarious partner and a cat that tolerates me sometimes. And I acknowledge there are people who are suffering far worse than I am. But all I can say is this, and I'll say it again, think of your mental health and be kind to yourself. Reach out to each other and I will try and do the same. So on that note, this episode's guest is Fiona Gibbs. She's a violinist, researcher, lecturer and the founder of Orchestra Vitae. This conversation was recorded the week before that week where everything went bananas. Remember that week? It was the day where later on in the afternoon the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. So cast your mind back to a time where coronavirus was becoming increasingly more and more invasive. Have a listen to my chat with Fiona. <laughs> Well, I guess our combination is very lower string heavy, so lots of very grumpy oh, yeah, cello and double bass. duets. <laughs> Do you play together? Not so much, really. I think every few years or so, we get the urge to play Rossini duo, and uh, okay. you know, yeah. it's like the famous double bass cello duet, and we put it on the stand, and then I think we'll get to a point that soon we'll, we'll play it properly, but yeah. for years it was like, oh, this is too hard, oh, this is too hard, or you don't have the opportunity to perform it properly. So. Yeah, I know that's true. And also when you're like doing, like if you're working together in other stuff mm. or when you get home, you've got like life stuff to deal with. You're yeah. not necessarily going to play. That exactly. Yeah. Like buying mm. furniture or just, you know, oh, yeah. just seeing each other. Um, yeah. yeah. So we have a bit of a, a mental week at the moment because we moved from Birmingham, mm. both being freelancers. Yeah. So the only way to do it is to like basically go back to Birmingham to do some work. What? Yeah, so that's weird. That was the, the only way we could make it work because we both had so much teaching in Birmingham. Okay. So we managed to get all of our teaching onto two days. And like, 
we go up on a Monday and we blitz it mm-hmm. and we come back Tuesday night. So, and that's what you did last night. Yeah. So, and it, yeah. so is Wednesday sort of your weekend then? Wednesday, Thursday, sort of like weekend, but yeah, we, we also like work then as well. So, yeah. yeah. Well, if things come up, then you have to take it. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah. I think as a freelancer, there's not necessarily such a thing as a day off because it's just. Yeah an open window for more work if it comes up <laughs> yeah or just like mentally I think I I mean I really struggle with like boundaries mm-hmm. especially with like and for a while I thought I really wanted a like a, a proper job you know <laughs> inverted commas <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but no way now and I love it mm. like I'm really happy with what what you know the kind of mix of stuff but it's also knowing when to stop is hard yeah so. knowing when to say be able to say no because yeah, even to yourself. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> with Vito, you know, that's like, yeah. okay, I need to stop working on this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to go to sleep. Yeah, yeah. I find that sometimes with the podcast, you could I'm just sure, you yeah. could just stay up all night and just edit and, you like, know, re-record promo things. material or yeah. whatever, yeah, exactly. It's just, yeah. yeah, it's one of those things, but... It's all-consuming. Yeah. So I haven't said yet, welcome to the podcast, Fiona Oh, Gibbs. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about what you've been up to this week, enjoying a bit of a weekend on a Wednesday and Thursday, but how else do you fill your days during the week besides teaching and you mentioned your orchestra, Orchestra Vitae? So I am a freelance lecturer. Okay. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's new. So I did a PhD at the Royal College of Music. Okay. Um, and that was uh, essentially a cultural history of the Royal Albert Hall. So um, I graduated from RCM in 2018. And yeah, now I do freelance lecturing and I'm prepping at the moment for a conference. So what's your topic that you're lecturing? Uh, well, the the conference title is sort of music or not just music, but an uncertain world is the conference title. And it's not just about music, it's like about the environment and politics and kind of society in general and especially with things sort of how they are at the moment with like lots of kind of populist governments and stuff and everything that's going on with the environmental kind of stuff like with Greta and Fridays yeah so just sort of like it feels like a quite uh, an unstable time I guess yeah, definitely uncertain. Uncertain, yeah. <laughs> and um, also the impact that that has on mental health. Mm. So um, I'm actually talking about what we're going to talk about today, which yeah. is concert drums and how hopefully through the orchestra we might be able to have a really positive impact on mental health. Mm. So that's a little bit of what I'm doing at the moment. I do a lot of teaching. Yeah. teach violin and piano. And yeah, I play violin in sort of orchestras and chamber music. Um, sort of like gigs and stuff. A little bit of everything, really. Literally a bit of everything. Yeah. I wouldn't have it any other way, though. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I think I read a, a quote from Stephen Fry recently, and he said, mm. we shouldn't regard ourselves as nouns, but more as verbs. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah very, mm. Stephen, very Stephen Fry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how if you have an idea of what you want to be, then quite often it's quite difficult to achieve that. You know, yeah. Like, I want to be a violinist. What does that mean? And then... I'm sure we know loads of people who set out to do that one thing and then Mm. encounter so many challenges along the way. But if you don't know what you're going to be, but you're just focusing more on what you're doing, then it opens up so many more avenues. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think like what you want to be changes a lot, especially like after you leave education and like technically only left education sort of two years ago. (laughs) So my feelings of like, what I want to do and what I want to be have really changed over the last couple of years Mm -hmm. so but in like a really positive way you know I think I've sort of just become more like open to lots of different avenues and stuff I think I'm the same as well and you sort of have to be as a freelancer yeah I wonder if this is related to what you're talking about with being uncertain but Mm. there's more of an increase now in people taking freelance roles there's more of that unstableness that uncertainty going on in, in our industry and that that can be really unsettling a little mm. bit of what we were saying before how it can be difficult to know when to say no but also I think like there's that side of it but also it gives you more autonomy because you can absolutely choose so or you know within reason you can choose what you want to do yeah which is nice. hopefully you get to a point where you can yeah say yeah no <laughs> yeah oh no but just like in terms of you can you know, if you want to spend time doing like your own project or mm. something, then you can decide to take that time and do that, which is 
not as easy, I guess, if you have a nine to five. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Mm. It's somewhat freeing in a way. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I like to think so. Anyway. That's how I feel at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then just mm-hmm. setting expectations for yourself, I think, is very important. Yeah. And making yeah. sure your project doesn't become dictated by other people's expectations. Yeah. No, that's definitely, definitely true. As you mentioned before, you run Orchestra Vitae. I do. And you're the founder of this orchestra. Mm. And from your humble beginnings in 2012, eight years ago now, it's now turned into a professional organization performing to audiences in various venues as well as offering outreach to new audiences. Tell us a little bit about what drove you to start your own orchestra Mm -hmm. because I imagine it's not a decision taken lightly. (laughs) No. Well, you say that. So I co-founded the orchestra with Michael Cobb and we were both studying in in London both sort of working and we essentially started the orchestra because we wanted to play Brahms 1. (laughs) Good choice. (laughs) So we've been talking about it for a really long time and then we both went to a New Year's Eve party New Year's Eve like Mm 2011-2012. So we were about to embark on the year of like the London Olympics Uh and it just felt like a really positive time and we were both sort of early 20s and everything just felt really possible you know at that age I think well certainly I just you know was very kind of like let's just do it you know yeah you're at that point in your life where you've got a bit of a blank canvas yeah and you can just fill your days doing whatever you like really yeah and it was really amazing really because we were just like shall shall we just do it and um, and we did. So um, the first concert was in April 2012 at St. Stephen's Church on Gloucester Road. And we played Elgar's Cocaine Overture and Brahms 1. That's all we did. The Elgar what overture? Cocaine. Okay. I don't know that piece. I thought you said cocaine. <laughs> okay. I think I, I think I pronounced it right. I have no idea. I'm sure there are people listening to this podcast who <laughs> probably know what that piece is, but I don't. I, I will admit. Yeah. So that was how it started. It very much started for fun. And it was our friends and colleagues, just people we knew that we sort of invited to play. It was, And it sort of went on from there as a sort of student outfit, really. Mm-hmm. And then really just things kept kept going so it was just it was really fun no reason to stop at that point (laughs) no exactly and sort of opportunities came up so um we did a piece by Stephen Montague and it was a ginormous orchestra with a choir and it took up like half of St John's auditorium it was incredible (laughs) um and like with organ and like water glasses (laughs) wow (laughs) it was just incredible yeah and things like that just sort of people were like oh do you want to do this do you want so we just kept saying yes yeah um and then obviously you get a bit older and everybody's careers move on and so then at that point I made the t- decision that I sort of wanted to continue with Vitae but I wanted it to be a professional orchestra so how did you cross that line from student organization to becoming a professional organization well I guess we're still on the journey. Mm. I assume it's probably a journey that you always, that you're always on. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, essentially, it comes down to funding because you make a commitment to sort of essentially pay your players, mm. and as as you, any organisation should aim to, I think. Yes, know? absolutely. Yeah. And you will attract good players if they know that they're feeling valued. Exactly. And I think that's really important. And I wouldn't really want to continue it if that wasn't possible. Mm-hmm. So this year is the sort of relaunch of Vitae with that in mind. So Had you taken a bit of a break beforehand? We perform at St. John's Smith Square and we have done since 2013. Um, so we didn't do any concerts there last year and we just took some time to kind of, I guess, assess what we wanted to achieve. But we did sort of, sort of commissioned work. So we did a concert at Wince Castle oh, nice. for um, yeah. St. John's Ambulance, that kind of thing. We did work for other people, but we didn't do our own promotes. Sure, yeah. Mm. And now feeling a bit more refreshed, you can yeah, come um, back. And I think it's really important, especially when you're hoping to be a professional organisation, that you really know why you're doing something. Mm-hmm. And Vita had always felt, amazing and really fun and really positive but trying to put sort of any kind of label on it felt had always felt quite of a challenge so orchestras are expensive as we know yes. how yeah. do you secure funding 
for your ensemble. But it definitely, like I said, is still on that journey. Mm-hmm. Um, but just I would always say try and be like as creative as possible, and definitely like lot from lots of different places essentially. Okay. So in terms of fundraising, you've got different sources. Different sources. So yeah. we do, like I said, we do some corporate work and commissions for like choirs and things like that, and then you have gifts and donations from you know wonderful supporters yeah and then you know applying for funding through things like the arts council and things like that and i think Um, applying for arts council is quite difficult isn't it because you have to really push forward your unique selling point yes and actually we have never been successful in arts council funding Mm -hmm. up to this point they've been really supportive Mm -hmm. and we've had some great feedback but that's still something that we're hoping to achieve. It's tricky. Yeah. And I, I know from a previous podcast guest, mm. a lot of the time it does depend on who you're up against in the panel um, yeah, just that at day. Yeah, that time. Yeah. yeah and literally. what other projects are going on at, at the same time. So mm. it really is a bit of a lottery sometimes. But mm. I think they do encourage you to keep trying. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been really, really positive, like I said. So hopefully. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. So speaking of unique selling points, and you mentioned mm. uh, very briefly before about concert chums, mm. and you're hoping that this is your ticket to make Vitae more distinctive yeah. as an orchestra. Mm. Tell us a little bit more about concert chums and what the initiative is behind it. So it all started, like I said, I've wanted, very much wanted, and have always felt that Vitae has had a really sort of positive impact on our audiences and on our players like everybody always said it was really lovely mm-hmm. to be part of Vitae but I've always sort of struggled with like I said like labeling that or capturing that in something that we could sort of say come to our concerts and you will experience this yeah <laughs> come to our concerts it's yeah. lovely <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> can't put that on a poster but in 2015 sadly my father passed away and when something like that happens, it gives you sort of completely different perspective on life. And obviously there are lots of challenges for, well, for the rest of the family who are left behind after mm. something like that happens. And I was very lucky when I was growing up, my parents, not musical at all, but they were massively supportive and got two younger brothers who mm. are also professional musicians. And... They have been to hundreds of concerts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just came to everything and it was amazing. So one of the challenges after my dad died was for my mum because she still wanted to come to all the concerts and sometimes she would come with friends. But there was absolutely no way that she would miss out if it meant coming by herself. Mm. So then when she did come by herself, sometimes she would find that it would sort of exacerbate, I guess, the loneliness that she was potentially already feeling. Mm -hmm. I suppose also because she would associate going to concerts. With going with my dad, exactly. So it was already an emotional experience. Yeah. But then if nobody talks to you at a concert, and, you know, I can see it from the other point of view as well, sort of sometimes people go to concerts to take time out Mm -hmm. or escape there. You know, their friends or their family or whatever. (laughs) Just have time for themselves. But I think if you're, you know, if you're looking for engagement, if you're sort of hoping that, you know, you go to something and people will chat to you Mm. and nobody does, if you're already feeling a bit low or sort of anxious, that's difficult. So we sort of talked about this, me and my mum, quite a bit. Well, essentially, it made me feel like, well, there must be other people in this situation. Mm. And not just because of bereavement, but, you know, loneliness affects loads of people yeah and at all stages of life in all walks of life you know for students younger people obviously like elderly people who might find it difficult to get to concerts but that was the uh, light bulb moment I guess when I was like well I wonder if there's something that we can do Mm -hmm. or that I can do to kind of alleviate some of this um and that's when I came up with concert chums so this is essentially an idea where At our concerts, there will be a group of volunteers and they'll be there to sort of signpost the facilities and things so that if anybody was a bit anxious, you know, you know that there's going to be someone there to like help you find those kinds of things. But also just to like be on the lookout for people, potentially on their own, but also, you know, not on their own and just engage our audiences in in a bit of a chat. You know, they'll be able to talk about the music that we're going to play and about the orchestra, they were to chat about the orchestra. 
with our audiences and just create a really sort of safe, supportive and welcoming environment for everyone. You know, of course, if people have come to our concert to escape their daily grind, then, you know, they'll be respectful of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask, actually, yeah. how would a volunteer know if someone wanted that engagement or if they wanted to just have their own space? Yeah, exactly. I think it's something that we'll chat with the volunteers about quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But just, you know, you can tell, you know, if you go up somewhere and say, like, oh, so why are you at this concert? Are you yeah. supporting someone in the orchestra? And if they're like, I'm just reading my program, <laughs> <laughs> yep. you know, then that's fine. And, you know, they have to be allowed their space as well. Mm. But at the same time, it's, it's sort of just about being aware and creating that space for people. I think that's really important because in this day and age, it's very easy for people to not be very sensitive to what other people are feeling because it's very common for people to just be thinking about themselves and how they're coming across in the world. But it's reversing those roles and showcasing a bit more empathy. And like I said, Vite had always felt really positive. And I think that's because we'd always had great support from our friends and family. We always did a lot of quite large concerts. So the orchestra was often sort of 80, 90 people, <laughs> oh, yeah. which yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Um, but also that then if people support everybody in the orchestra, you can end up with an audience of people who are really rooting for you, which is mm. incredible. We always referred to ourselves as like Team OV. And it's just really sort of making that feel that more people can join that and mm. that we can welcome more people into like the Orchestra Vitae family. It's more inclusive, isn't it? Because you're not having that audience perform a divide. You're in- exactly. instead bringing people together and sharing yeah. with the audience, which is essentially what you're trying to do as a performer. Yeah, and I think like we've always been really so vocal about breaking boundaries. And I think like most orchestras are that mm-hmm. you know you want to reach out to your audience, you want your audience to feel special. Essentially, you want your audience to feel that if they weren't there, it wouldn't be the same event. Yeah. So, I think this is hopefully a way of making our audience really feel special. You've got to value your audience as much as the audience values the performers. If they weren't there, we we wouldn't be there. Yeah. And <laughs> I think there's something about playing music or, you know, almost where people sometimes forget. I'm very interested in how music and people work together, how one affects the other. You know, if there's a way of having a really positive impact on people through music, I just think that's amazing. It's about communication and it's about connection because you could go to a concert where you feel like the performers don't really want to be there or they don't really want to share anything, and then you'd think, well, why did I go to this concert? But I Mm -hmm. think the concerts that really do touch you and really are set apart are the ones that speak to you in some way. And there are so many ways of doing that, and it's just finding your ensemble's way of reaching out. And actually, interestingly, one of the things that I sort of discovered, if you like, which sounds like obvious, but I think it's always worth stating, when I was doing my PhD research, is that... If you go to a concert or an event and everybody there is having a great time, Mm -hmm. that will mean that you are much more likely to have a good time. Yes. This is why they have those laugh tracks in sitcoms. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because everybody's laughing. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But, well, first of all, if you were to watch a sitcom and it didn't have that laugh track, a lot of the time you'd be like, ooh, that felt a bit flat. But quite often you are watching something and... If you're alone by yourself, you're not going to laugh out loud like you would if you were with friends. Yeah. And so it's that kind of ripple effect, isn't it, of people's experiences affecting everyone else? Yeah. Actually, and the term for it is called collective engagement. Oh. Uh, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's very good. That's yeah. A, that's a good buzzword to use for yeah. your Arts Council funding oh, yeah, application. <laughs> so, um, so it's been nice because I've been able to use my research for it as well. And it's so true, you know, if you if you go to a gig or something and you can tell if you know everybody's having a great time obviously if it's like I don't know some amazing band Mm -hmm. it's obvious everybody's having a great time but you can always tell in orchestral concerts well I think yeah I saw um Dudamel yeah and the Venezuelan Youth Orchestra oh wow yeah and I've seen them a couple of times and every time the atmosphere is electric yeah and there's nothing like it and even though I did Marla too it was obviously silent the whole way through Mm. And then it, they finish and you could hear like, it's, it's like a pin drop. Yeah. But then everyone went crazy. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Because um, it's, like it's the energy from the players and the mm. performers, isn't it? And then 
the audience feeds off that. It's mm. just, I suppose, in a classical concert, it's not demonstrated immediately, is it? No. Everyone yeah. holds it in until the very end and then they just go nuts. Yeah. But, yeah, it's true. What you say about this collective in- engagement, people mm. talk about the vibe yeah. of a gig or a concert or something. And, you know, it's not something that you can necessarily see, but you can feel. And, yeah, you know, I think so. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So when is the debut for Concert Chums? So um, we're going to do our next concert on April the 22nd, which is at St John's Smith Square. Brilliant. And what's the yeah. programme? So we are uh, going along with the Beethoven 250th. Um, so we're going to play Beethoven 7. But we're also um, playing Mozart Divertimento in D. Mm-hmm. And we're playing a piece by the composer Hilary Tan, a Welsh composer, but she currently lives in the United States. Uh-huh. And it's called The Water's Edge. So okay. it's kind of folky. It's just for strings. Oh, nice. And she'll actually also be at our concert. Ah, so see, she, that's a good opportunity for engagement as well. Hilary's going to be there at our pre-concert talk. Mm. And she's also going to be part of our um, school's outreach that we're doing during the day. Mm-hmm. So we'll be talking a bit about Beethoven in that, but also we're very keen to show the children that there is a living composer, yeah. a female living composer. <laughs> yeah, very important. And just yeah. to get that insight into someone's work. Yes, definitely. And they'll be able to ask her questions and then our audience will be able to ask her questions. Yeah. And then the other piece is Haydn 90. So um, the Beethoven, the Tan and the Divertimento are all um, conducted by Pablo Urbina. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, Haydn 90 is conducted by Philip Keller, who is our guest conductor for the evening. Oh, Mm. right. So two conductors in a concert. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Passing the baton. As we mentioned before, Mm. your mum going to concerts. So this leads me to talk about how evocative music can be towards the memory of certain people or Mm. situations. So what music reminds you of your family, in particular your dad? So the last concert that my dad watched the three of us in was actually an orchestra vitae concert. It's a really special memory because we played with Wimbledon Choral Society for their centenary and it was at the Royal Festival Hall. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the only time the orchestra has played at the Royal Festival Hall. And um, this is in 2015. And it was a, a really good program in that it included Brahms Requiem. So I was very happy, but Brahms. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But also the hall was basically full. And it, we were talking about sort of electric atmospheres. It was amazing. And there were so many people there, like friends and family there to support, obviously Wimbledon, mm. but also there to support us. And... Both my mum and dad were really, really proud. Like, all three of us played in it. And I remember telling the orchestra, right, we're going on, and sort of leading them out. And it was just like, right. (laughs) Yeah, well, there's the the Team OV spirit coming out again. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I was so proud. It was very emotional. Mm. But I'm so happy that he saw that. And that that's just such an amazing memory to have, that that was the last time the five of us were sort of together in that environment. Yeah, so that obviously is really so poignant for for him my mum so she she actually loves barry manilow oh great yep so um <laughs> from brahms to barry yeah. absolutely yeah. <laughs> and um i think i was about two when i first went to see barry manilow two yeah, yeah, really? yeah. <laughs> um well they didn't want to leave me at home so. yeah sure I mean, why not <laughs> he gets a lot of steak but also, he's a great showman. He performed at the last night of the proms last last year in oh, proms really? in the park. Oh, okay. yeah, so I went with my mum, <laughs> and we just had a great time. So whenever Barry's on, you know, it always mm. reminds me. You know, makes me think about her. Yeah. And she always went to see Barry Manlow with her with her aunt. Mm-hmm. So I think like it's kind of nice, like the yeah. relationships are sort of passed. Yeah, passed it ties, down. It ties yeah. your family together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's but it's though. nice. But yeah. that's the thing about like a lot of those pop artists that, as yeah. you say, you get a lot of shake or whatever. Mm. You have to appreciate the showmanship that they have and are able to perform with. Because the times that I've been in a string section playing with a pop star or whatever, and it's it is common for a lot of classically trained people to be like, oh, it's just a pop gig or whatever. But actually, there is a lot of 
art and skill in what they do I'm, yeah, definitely. to yeah. do basically the same thing every single night but make it different, make it fresh after 30, 40 years, you know, in yeah. some cases. I mean, he sings some of the same songs. He's been singing those songs for decades. Mm. And to still make the lyrics speak to people or that, you know, they still want to go and see him live because that will touch them in some way. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing talent. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 I think we, as musicians, you, you know, I mean, I'm classically trained and there as well, but you have to appreciate everybody. But certainly, as I've got older, I have appreciated him more and more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Copacabana. Yeah. That's the only. Is, is that oh, Barry? yeah. Yeah, that's Barry Manilow, Manilow isn't yeah. it? I'm just trying yeah. to think of other songs by him, but I can't remember. Uh, um, is it like Can't Smile Without You, that kind of thing? Oh, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to put on a Barry Manilow playlist later and do oh, some yeah. research. Mm-hmm. Um, and how about for yourself? What are your absolute favourite pieces of repertoire? You've mentioned Brahms a few times. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a bit crazy, but I, I really do just love just love music. Mm. Um, That's not crazy at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think people always do want, you know, specifics. Right. Sure. But um, there are some other pieces that have, like, really positive memories. Mm. So, for example, the first orchestral piece I played was Chike 5. Nice. Tchaikovsky's yep. Fifth. And I was 11 playing at the back of Second <gasps> Violins. Oh, wow. And um, I don't think I touched that piece until I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when the, like, the wind and brass came in. I obviously only mm. ever played with string ensembles. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know? yeah, I remember having that feeling, yeah. I think. When I was uh, playing in my first you know, full symphony orchestra mm. as, as a teenager, and I remember hearing the sound of good wind players for the first time. And as a string player, I totally get that because you, you don't hear it. I mean, you hear a lot of string stuff. You, you're surrounded by a lot of the same. And then when you hear good winds and good brass, it's, it's yeah, it's quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> that is a great memory. And I think it was that moment where I was like, oh, I love playing an orchestra. And I mean, I've always loved playing in orchestras. But also um, when I was 17, we went, oh, I went on a youth orchestra tour to Italy. And we played a lot of British music. Mm-hmm. And um, as I think youth orchestras do when they go abroad sometimes. Yeah, well, I guess yeah. British youth orchestras <laughs> yeah. would do. Exactly, I, yeah. yeah, I hardly played any British music at all until I oh, moved yeah, to the UK. Course. And then everyone was like, St. Paul's sweet. So we were playing Elgar. Mm-hmm. And we were playing Enigma Variations. Um, so a little bit cheesy. But we were playing outside in Italy under in the, sort of like the market square of this little town. And it had been a massively hot day really really hot day and you could sort of tell it was going to be a big thunderstorm <laughs> so we played the Elgar and that was really amazing and then we played Britain for sea interludes so there's a one called Storm <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> and yeah. we literally played it in a storm wow oh, it was sort of rained a lot but because we were covered it was fine yeah and it's a prophetic uh, fallacy at its finest um, isn't it <laughs> yeah so much and there was just this bit where the timpani plays well throughout it but there was a, a particular moment where the timpani was playing and there was lightning happening <laughs> i was just like you could not make this up <laughs> yeah totally it's like playing to a film or something again when you're when you're young and everything you you haven't developed any cynicism you uh-huh. know well yeah. not so much anymore. and um yeah. it was just really incredible and everybody came off completely buzzing hmm. so um yeah that's a, a nice memory as well it's funny mm. that you mentioned cynicism because yes mm. i feel like you go into a phase of cynicism don't you and then you come out of it on the other end yeah and you're like it doesn't matter yeah it doesn't matter you get older and you're like mm, who cares like what's i thinking of yeah exactly yeah. you see it a lot in musicians yeah i guess it's probably throughout the arts because mm-hmm. it's so subjective and i think it does get yeah. com- compounded with the more you learn the more you know and expectations placed upon yourself and then you get older and you think actually no that doesn't matter <laughs> exactly yeah i think especially in in those sort of early 20s mid 20s years mm-hmm. where you're like oh I, I think I should be doing this or mm. somebody else thinks I should be doing yeah that, or, what do other people think of me it's very tricky and especially like you're always comparing I think at that age of you know am I doing the right thing yeah. what's other what are other people doing mm-hmm. and then yeah you come out of it at the other end in your 30s <laughs> yeah and you're like oh it's it's actually fine yeah. it's all good we just do our own thing <laughs> I think yeah as you say comparing I think mm. that is one of the reasons that it's hard for a lot of musicians to say what it is they do. You know, when someone just asks you, what the have you been chat. up to? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, yeah. Oh, you know, this and that, bits mm. and bobs. But I think it comes from, you know, when you're in, in college and you're the early stages of your career or in your early 20s or whatever. Mm. And 
you're scared of comparing yourself to other people because you might be in a situation where you're getting way less work than someone else or no work at all or you're getting more work than someone else. You don't want to make people feel bad or you don't want to make yourself feel bad. I thought it just seems to come from that. Yeah, I think so. And I think especially at that age where you might feel it's hard to separate yourself from what you do, especially with music, because, you know, if you're in music, you're, you're in it because you love it, yeah. I think. And because it's something that you can't possibly imagine not having in your life. Mm. So your kind of sense of being, I guess, is all tied up with your ability to do something. Yeah. That's very true, isn't it? Because you've made this decision. You're going to pursue this with every fiber of your being. Yeah. And then, as, as you say, like, you come out the other end and realize there's a lot more out there as well. Yeah, and I think, actually, there is space for you to do almost whatever you want to do. You know, it's about owning it. So mm. if you're like, I want to, I don't know, play the bagpipes <laughs> in like a hot country in order to like <laughs> provide the children of a different culture with like knowledge of Scottish culture, then uh -huh. you can go and do that. Do it. There will be an audience. Yeah. <laughs> do it with conviction and, and someone will be keen. <laughs> yeah. But I think also if you love what you do, Yes, it's important to be good at it, but I think just that kind of passion and, yeah, a sense of that you want to create something good is equally as important mm. and that people will kind of tap into that as much as how how well you're playing it. Yeah. So, you know, it's important to play in tune. Of course it's important yeah, to play in tune. Yeah. But there's no point playing in tune if, if, it's, if you don't care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. we'd all be robots, wouldn't we? Yeah. And... You need that passion, as we were talking about before, on stage mm. to give off that vibe, that energy yeah, that really feeds into the audience. So. Yeah. And, you know, there are so, I mean, how many weddings have you played Pacabella? But every <laughs> single time, everyone's like, oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That's so true. You have to remember that while it's gig number 157, whatever, <laughs> that it's the one and only wedding for that couple. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's, that's a challenge, yeah. you know, because like... The other side of doing music as a as a career or, you know, anything kind of artistic like that is that it uh, inevitably it does become your job. Yeah. So, you know, in any job, I think it's difficult to kind of keep that sense of big perspective. You're hopefully making a difference. Yeah. Keep that passion and keep that fire in your belly. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Maybe difficult on Pacabell number 157, but you know. <laughs> oh, you can play around with tempos and make <laughs> yeah. the violinist panic. <laughs> Oh, I had to play that. No, I had to play that last weekend, actually. Oh, okay. But it was, uh, I think I was just struggling to keep warm because it was freezing cold. Oh, it was yeah. in this um, sort of shabby chic rundown chapel mm -hmm. in Peckham and it was freezing cold. I think it was actually warmer outside, but I had my coat on. I mean, like the dress code was all black and I was wearing my blue coat because I just got to a point where I was like, I don't care. I just need to stay warm. And so I remember playing, but this new struggle, which I've never encountered before, was playing with the weight of all my clothes. Oh, I was just keeping yeah. my arms up. I'm not, not used to that. Mm. Like, you know, try it one day, like put on all of your clothes and then just try and play something really simple. And then you realize how you get used to just one thing. Mm. This part of the podcast is the wild card question round. Ooh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> so this is your opportunity to choose what I ask you next based on three topics. Right. Okay. Yeah. We all love a surprise. <laughs> so we've got three topics and you can choose one. We have, if you weren't a musician, non-musical pursuits, and what I'm listening to. If I wasn't a musician. If you weren't a musician, what profession would you be? I think probably like a journalist or something. Mm -hmm. I said earlier, I'm really interested in music and people. So yeah, I'm interested in people in general. I did history at school as well. That was like my other great passion. Yeah. So if I hadn't done music, I would have gone down the kind of history route. You've got the skills mm -hmm. for research having done a PhD. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I imagine there's something in your brain that craves... Craves? I don't know if that's the right word, but something in your brain that um, strives towards, you know, finding out information. Yeah, like new information and learning. Yeah. I'm always sort of, yeah, always want to know what sort of what's going on in the world and stuff. Uh -huh. um, yeah, recently that's been more of a challenge, just to like 
almost no like they teach you at school how to look at sources so that's really interesting now with like fake news and stuff yeah gosh yeah it's mm. it's finding the right information and it's different when you're at school because you're told to look at particular sources but you might not necessarily have the flexibility to be able to choose what sources yeah they are how do you trust what's right and what's not i think that's a big challenge i guess at school you're yeah you're, you're told which sources to use you know if uh, whichever Mm -hmm. bit of history that you're studying but then as you get older you're aware of so many more and even topics that maybe you've studied for years and years suddenly become completely different yeah because you're given different senses of perspective yes absolutely or you realize oh my goodness there was a whole bit there that I didn't see before but you just look at it in a slightly different light Maybe because of your own life experiences or whatever, but all of a sudden it was there and you just think, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, people really want, you know, we're in a day and age where you have access to information 24-7, which is amazing, but also a huge challenge for us to like actually work out what's true. It's and daunting, yeah. isn't it? Just trawling through it all sometimes. Uh, I mean, like, to get really topical right now, but just, you know, talking about coronavirus for mm. example and there's so much information out there and like my phone just like bleeps and gives me notifications of new news articles I should yeah. really turn that picture off <laughs> yeah but then you're just thinking oh do I have to read all this and so then sometimes I just don't want to read anything at all yeah well I think <laughs> especially over the last few years um it's it's been quite difficult to know what to engage with and because people are very they have really strong opinions, which I think is really important. It's great that people are passionate about opinions, but there's a way of doing that. Sometimes you have to tune out. Yeah. And I think that's also important that you're like, okay, I am at information saturation point. <laughs> totally. You because I, I suppose if you engage with absolutely everything, then that's not good for your mental, mental health. No, health. Yeah. You, you will definitely want to come to chum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Help me. <laughs> Just talk to me about something else. <laughs> Would yeah. a concert chum do that? Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I hope so. That, yeah. You know, you just like haven't, you know, a big part of it is just having a nice chat. Yeah. You know, having someone to listen to you, I think is really important. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. We love a good listener. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences as founder of Orchestra Vitae. And where can people find out more information about yourself, the orchestra and the concert chums? So um, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. Um, just Orchestra Vitae. Mm -hmm. um, we have a website, um, www.orchestravitae.co.uk. Mm -hmm. And I also have my own website, which is www.musicpeopleplaces.com. Musicpeopleplaces? Yeah, com. That's, my, that's my website. It sort of talks a little bit about my research, looking at sort of the connections between society and people and music and then the places that we sort of do music in. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. You're a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. It's been great. Cheers. Hope you enjoyed that chat, that actual face-to-face -face chat I had with Fiona. My, how times have changed since then. I remember it was an absolute mission getting to her flat. Not least because I had my cello on my back, as well as all my recording gear. But City Mapper, remember that app, which you probably don't use anymore. City Mapper had sent me to the wrong place on the opposite side of the train tracks. So I could see her building, but I couldn't get to it without either scaling a fence, trespassing the tracks, or walking around 15 minutes. I was even knocking on the door of a stranger's place with the same house number for an embarrassingly long time. Luckily, they weren't home. Fortunately, her lovely partner Mark, good partner name, came and met me halfway and eased the burden somewhat. These are problems that we just do not have anymore. Do bear in mind the April 22nd concert that she mentioned has been postponed for glaringly obvious reasons now and will be on November the 20th in some form or other. Till then, OV has some online initiatives which you can check out, which include Q&A sessions with their conductor Pablo Urbina on Instagram and on YouTube, an educational video called Overcoming Challenges, and concert charm chats where musicians have a video call with an isolating person, play them a piece, which can be a request, and have a chat with them. It sounds very positive and heartwarming. 
So you can check out OV's socials in the show notes. This week's Music College Didn't Prepare Me comes from a string player friend of mine who recently got a job working from home as a company director's assistant. Music College didn't prepare me for my boss, who seems to have issues with keeping track of his own email inbox, so we've come up with a solution. I ask him on the phone if he's followed up on an email and he says no, and then chucks a small tantrum when he can't find the email in his inbox. So then I go and forward the email to him again. The email from him. In his inbox. Did Music College prepare me for this? I don't know. Maybe it did? Hashtag improvising. Well, you're definitely playing it by ear, so I'd say so. At least if you're working as a busy gigging musician, you have the organisational and logistical skills to be a successful assistant. Transferable skills, innit? Remember, if you have something that Music College didn't prepare you for that you'd like shared or discussed on the podcast, then let me know, as it comes podcast at gmail.com. That's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. Tremendous thanks to Fiona Gibbs for agreeing to chat to me back in March, even when I arrived at her flat all grumpy and a sweaty mess. And thank you for listening. Get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or, in case you missed it, via my new website, asitcomes.com. You can get in touch there. It's only taken me a year to set up. Better late than never. Like and follow the pod on Facebook and Instagram at As It Comes Pod. Remember to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word. Thank you for continuing to do so. It's much appreciated. I'll say it one last time. Think of your mental health. Chat to you soon. Bye.